This is Lesson 12 from Unit 3 for November the 20th, 2016. And it is entitled, Life and Healing from our Faith Pathway Study Manual. Uh, when we look at this, it's still under Unit 3, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Our devotional reading is Psalms 46. Our background scripture is Revelations 22, 1 through 7. And our printed passage is Revelations 22, verses 1 through 7. And our key verse is, The angel showed me the river of the waters of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Revelations 22 and 1. Our lesson's aims are to research the biblical references to the river of life, to learn its spiritual, symbolic, and material impact on humans. To appreciate that in the new, or in the river of life, as God's continual provision for sustaining a full and rich life. Respond to the river of life through acceptance, faith, and interest into the fullness of of the kingdom. These are our lessons aims and this is a rich lesson and it is assembled around a reservoir if you would and a river that empties out into a larger vessel or body of water the sea. It is cleansed and then it resurges through the landscape and channels that God have created, which empties out into lakes and into ponds and into creek beds and rivers. And this is really explained well if we read into the 47th chapter of Ezekiel. But let us begin uh, the start of our lesson as we look at the introduction. Uh, and it centers around um, one of the things about the river of life is it has a cycle. It is a continuation. And so when we look at the introduction to our lesson, it begins by explaining the fall of mankind and what God's intention was that God never intended for man to be separated although God knew of man's weakness but it was not his intention it was his intention was to maintain relationship with man and to constantly be in relationship with mankind so we will look at uh, some points that were lifted in the beginning. And these are things that have been overcome as we look and entertain what scripture is saying to us in Revelations, the 22nd chapter, verses 1 through 7. The introduction reads, in the beginning, God intended that humankind, the crown of his creation, would eternally enjoy the perfect environment he made for them. In this environment, there was security without locks, food without famine, work without toil, crops without weeds, and relationships without conflict. But that doesn't sound uh, normal or natural in the context of what we see in the world today but that was God's intention that was what God created but as we know man forfeited that and disobeyed God and as a result of man's disobedience sin transgression and evil wickedness 
entered the world from that time until now. And this disruption has caused a perfect fellowship that God intended humankind to enjoy. It has put a, a wedge. It has put a barrier in between that. So as we look at this and what this separation and this disconnect from a relationship intended by God with man, we now see that through man fulfilling the desires of himself, we see the curse of his transgression and we see sickness, disease, famine, wars, uh, physical death, as well as mental and spiritual death. Uh, but our lesson brings our attention to what the final, the finality of what God's intention was. And that is, as we read into our verses and beginning at verse uh, one, and this is from the NIV, and it says, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city on each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing twelve crops of fruit yielding its fruit every month and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nation now, our first commentary says that in both the Old and the New Testament, water was used to picture salvation and the Holy Spirit's refreshing presence in the lives of believers. And likewise, the river was symbolic of God's provision of eternal life for those who accept Christ as their Savior. Now, this river of life is reflective of Ezekiel's vision of a river flowing from beneath the temple in a restored Jerusalem. And this uh, we would like to read from Ezekiel, the 47th chapter. Now, in the 47th chapter of Ezekiel, the Lord is speaking to Ezekiel in a vision. And he takes him back to the temple and he shows him water flowing underneath the threshold of the temple. And he allows him to receive a, a lesson in this flowing of the river. And that lesson is still relevant for us today. Um, he showed him the water flowing in four directions on the north and the south, east and the west side uh, underneath the threshold of the temple. And when he first showed him the water, the water was coming up to his ankles. And then he showed him in another direction and he showed the water it was coming up to his knees and then he showed him in another direction and the water was coming up to his waist. And then he showed him the river in another direction and the water at that point was at a height that was above his waist. And he said that the man could not just walk and cross it, that he would have had to swim, that it had depth to it then. So what it was symbolically saying is, is that this water that he saw, that it was not uh, in a decreasing amount, but it was in an increasing amount. That every time he saw it, that it was more than what was shown to him in the previous setting, uh, showing that God has an increase that that there is not a lack of that there is not a short shortage or a decreasing in God's supply but there is an increase into it now I want to read uh, starting at the sixth verse and he said to me son of man have you seen this 
Then he brought me out and returned me to the back of the river. When I returned, there along the bank of a river were various or were many trees, one on one side and the other. And then he said to me, this water flows from the eastern region and it goes down into the valley and it enters into the sea where it reaches the sea, pardon me, when it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. Now, think about this. He allows him to see the increase of it. And then he brings him back and he says, uh, Son of man, did you see this? And he brings it to his attention that the water, the bank of the water, where it was running, there were trees on one side and on the other side of it. And that the water was flowing and it was coming through the valleys and it was emptying out in smaller canals into the sea. And at that point, the water was healed, it was refreshed. So whatever it brought with it from the land, it emptied out into this larger vessel and then the water was cleansed. And from that point, the water moved and it said, and it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the river goes, will live there will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. Now, when we think of this, as we are looking at it, this is a healing that God is showing to Ezekiel in the vision to cause him to recognize that as the water passes through the channel, uh, uh, channels that, that I have created with the stroke of my hand in the landscape, that it will travel through valleys. So there is no low spot that we can be in where God cannot reach us, where God's healing will not come to us. And then it even comes from the hills, from a high spot. So God is not so high. The healing is not so high that it doesn't recognize those in lower plains that also need the healing. And the water will filter down and then it will empty out. It will remove from us those things that are contaminants, those things that create barriers between us and the creator that won't allow us to maintain the relationship that was intended in the beginning. It will remove those things from us, whether we are in high plains or low plains, and it will filter it out into a larger vessel where it will be emptied and where it will remain. And at that point, it then that clean water flows back. And then it tells us that fish and trees and fruit will come from it because now the contaminants that hindered those things from being available to us, they will now be present for us because now God has cleansed the contaminants and removed those things so that we would receive the goodness of God. And then we would be in harmony with the goodness of God. Now, the lesson, it goes on to say, and no longer, and this is in verse three, will there be any curse. The throne of God and the lamb will be the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the 
light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Now it says that there will no longer be any curse. A lot of times uh, in life, uh, certain choices that we make, the consequences thereof land us with a curse. Uh, we pay a penalty and there is a penalty for sin. Um, but the lamb that was slain to pardon us of our sins has removed that curse from us and we no longer will be hovering under a curse. We don't hover those that have accepted Christ. That curse has been removed from us because the Lamb of God who came into the world to take away the sins of the world was slain on our behalf. And so now it says we will be God's servants. We will serve God. We will fulfill now the will that God intended for us. And it says that uh, we will see his face. Now this is uh, brought out in 1 John, the third chapter and the second verse. And it says that his name will be on our foreheads. Now just a couple of lessons back, we know that we were talking about the number of the beast and the mark of the beast and how you would not be able to engage into any activities and purchase any things without the mark of the beast. Well, if Satan marks his followers, then we have a holy mark. It is not uh, a, a mark that we go to tattoo uh, companies or businesses and put outer marks on our body. But these marks are spiritual marks. And this is that it will be a name which will be on our foreheads, meaning that God will touch the consciousness. He will settle the, the confusion and the perplexities of our mind. And he will put his mark of spirit and peace and give us contentment. And those thoughts that clutter our minds and cause us to have thoughts that we should not entertain, those things will be removed when God seals our thoughts and our minds with his signature on our bodies. So uh, we know that we will no longer have to be looking for any lamps or uh, any man-made lights, nor will we need uh, the lights that God created himself, uh, the sun or the moon or the stars, because the presence of God is so bright that there is no need for any light. Now, we would like to close as we uh, can capsulize this here, as we're looking at the end of our verse that says, the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angels to so show his servants the things that must soon take place. And then the angel said, look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. And this is speaking of Christ. Behold, I come quickly. Now those that are believers, we look for the return of Christ. Uh, we don't shudder at the talk and the discussion of uh, the calamities that come upon the earth when Christ returns. Uh, in Second Peter, uh, the third chapter, he gives us uh, uh, good instruction as to how we should respond. And I would like to read that in closing. This, this text here, 
this scripture is so well uh, spoken until it, it doesn't require anything to be added to it. There's no explanation that needs to be uh, connected to it. So let's just read it as it is. And I'm going to start it at the ninth verse. This is Second Peter 3, the third chapter, and starting at the ninth. <clears throat> the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness but is long-suffering towards us. Now, when we speak of uh, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, uh, that enjoined with this should also be uh, Isaiah, the 55th chapter and the 11th verse, because here it speaks of what, when God speaks, he doesn't just speak to hear himself. You know, some of us, we just like to hear ourselves talk. Um, uh, but when God speaks, God speaks for a purpose and whatever he speaks, that that spoken word, it goes out and it does not return to him void, but it accomplishes the purpose for which he sent it. So it says he's not slack uh, concerning his promise, it, but is long suffering towards us. Yeah, a lot of people complain about uh, the wrath of God, the punishment of God, but not, not the same attention is not focused on God's long suffering, but more focus is placed on what happens to me and how could a loving and forgiving and kind God do such a thing? Well, God also has provided a delay in his wrath so that none would perish. So let us focus the same amount of attention, uh, attention on that as well. It says, but as long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons are we to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of god because of which the heavens will be dissolved being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat nevertheless we according to his promise look for the new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells and we would like to leave you on that note. And as it is with our prayer, that something was said that lifted a bow down head, that provided some reassurance and confidence in the one and true living God. And we pray the blessings upon you. And most importantly, that as we hear the word of God, we would also act upon it and be doers of the word of God. God bless you and keep you is our prayer.